totally spies. Of all of the well-liked shows that I've talked shit about thus far, this is probably the highest on that list. I don't know if it would be ranked number one on a top ten shows that I hate that everyone else likes, but it would definitely have a place on that list. I really don't like the show. Look, I'm not here to reiterate fan opinions or fan outrage. Whenever you're watching one of my videos, it means that you're getting my opinion, and that doesn't always align with popular consensus. I'm sure there are plenty of things that I like that other people don't, and I'm sure that they've got their reasons for it. And I think that people get this, as the more and more that I've gone after these kind of shows that are cult classics, the less flack that people seem to give me. A and I do want to thank you for that. A lot of people liked Wayside and INK, and they respected my opinion on the matter. And when people do ask me about why I don't like this show, and a lot of people do, it's more in a curiosity or disbelief than actual anger or hatred. So, why why don't I like Totally Spies? Clever! Is this the guy you said you were majorly crushing on? Ooh, he's just as cute as you said he was. Remember that time we had to cancel a party because you told the neighbors about it? Or the time you told my English teacher I downloaded my essay from the internet? None of those were my fault! I can totally keep things to myself! <laughs> Alex, this is Fernando. We dated like a gazillion years ago. Well, I like totally have one reason. It's annoying much. Could you imagine if I like conducted the entire review like talking just like this? That would get pretty, like, grating pretty fast, wouldn't it? I'm gonna be blunt, half of my complaints come down to, well, all of the characters. Our three main girls all seem to be a different slice of the same valley girl stereotype. Sam is technically supposed to be the smart one, but she ends up being only smart by comparison. Clover is boy crazy. Her personality begins and ends there. In almost every single episode, she's pining for another boy. I think that she ends up having more crushes in the span of the show than there are males on planet Earth. And finally, there's Alex. She is Alex. I swear that I watched like 10 episodes in preparation for this review, and I've seen dozens growing up, and she has never done anything significant that would give me the slightest clue to her personal life in any of the episodes that I have seen. She's just there. And the valley girl accents, lingos, and inflections. Think of how much more time we could have saved if those pedestrians would have just stayed off the sidewalks. When you watch this show episode by episode, like I had to for this review, they start to grate. Like, a lot. It's like, totally not my thing. Y you know, I I'm gonna stop. I promise, I'll stop. I I'm gonna stop now. The accents do fit the show because this show is stupid. No, Donkey Kong Country was stupid. This show is what you'd get if you had a show actually written by Valley Girl stereotypes. Actually, that's an insult to actual Valley Girl stereotypes. Get ready to tuck and roll. I have so many questions. No, wait, I have all of the questions. Number one, uh, physics. Like, I need to get a degree in quantum engineering to figure out how to begin asking the questions that I need to to properly articulate this scene. And here's question number two. How does racquetball teach one to break the laws of physics? Three, and this is probably most obvious, why didn't you just use the laser on the door without all this mirror voodoo shit? This isn't a brain fart either. The show is constantly filled with moments like this. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You know what, let's start with the theme song. It's usually what I do, and it might give us some more insight into why I don't like the show, or why lots of people do. Well, the theme song is kind of mumbling at the start. I wonder if there's like a lyrical video or an extended version on YouTube. Wait, official music video? Suddenly, I'm very fascinated. All right, this looks interesting. Put your tongue in my ear, it's queer, but kind of fun. What the? Is this some kind of joke? Did somebody just put a random song on YouTube and just make the title Totally Spies Theme Song? Okay... So apparently the theme song is either a, a cut version or a cover of this song. Totally Spies was originally made to be aimed at kids, right? I don't do sex, but I do do sex. Mommy, what 
the sex means? So they asked this person, Moon Baby, to write this song because this is the first song that comes to your head when you think of a spy show. A and then the new theme song was sung by Girls Aloud. Was this show even originally supposed to be aimed at a younger audience or was this supposed to be going on like Adult Swim or something? Because uh, there's no way to get around this. Time for a taste of your own medicine, Doc. No! Oh. 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 Must have cookies! Huh. Must have cookies! When you talk about Totally Spies, you kind of have to talk about the fetish aspect. A show with tight spy bodysuits and gadgets that amount to disguised fashion accessories gets accused with pandering. Uh, who would have thought? The main plots of this show usually start at the mall with the girls talking about boys or fashion or going on shopping sprees. It's not all of them, but it's most of them. And that's that's really pandering to the girls. But this show is equal opportunity as it, it finds a way to pander to both sexes. And um, well, if you have a fetish and you were growing up in the 2000s, it is very likely that you discovered it from watching this show. In almost every episode, the girls are transforming into something. Usually Usually some kind of animal. The Passion Patties episode is quite clearly inflation. Not to mention that there's a spy show's worth of bondage here. If you go down the list of episodes, chances are you'll find one that fits your particular fetish. I'm not the only one to bring it up. It's the most common joke to be made about Totally Spies. That both boys and girls watch the show, but for vastly different reasons. But it's probably just the audience blowing things out of proportion. People make jokes about things like this all the time. I'll go get the rest of your things from the car. Then we can talk about safer career options, like being a librarian or a foot doctor. What I'm saying is that it's not an easy accusation to defend this show from. Then again, it's probably not something that needs to be defended. Put your tongue in my ear, it's queer, but kind of fun. Mostly. Audiences that are too young to really understand what's going on are just gonna see weird scenario transformations. It's not like Squidward hitting his head and becoming a baby and shitting in a diaper. And to the show's credit, the transformations and whatnot that happen in the show aren't too far out for the genre. It's just that it's so much more compacted in this one place. And if the show helped people discover an aspect of themselves, that's not something that I could be too angry about. Now, what I have an issue with is that the writing tends to be the level on the porn that the show gets accused of. And because I'm a masochist, and this episode is a fan favorite, I'm going to be taking a look at the three-part episode, Totally Busted. A lot of people ask me to take a look at the movie, but I've got a couple of big projects coming up, one of them being another movie review, so I thought that I'd make a happy compromise. And in hindsight, this turned out to be a much larger review than I thought it was going to be. That being said, I couldn't really talk about Totally Spies over the course of just one episode. The episode starts, and I quote, at the Freaky Laboratory at 6.30, where some random scientist is talking about suds. My suds will surely go down as the most memorable product in evil invention history! Y yeah the potion that looks like every other mad scientist potion. I don't think so. In fact, you're one of the most least key villains in this show. Oh, that reminds me, that's another thing that I don't like about this show, the villains. While they usually have memorable designs and personalities, and even plans, Actually, their plans. Let's talk about them. So, there's this episode, Beauty is Only Skin Deep. A fashion designer made a makeup spray to make everyone's face stuck at one emotion. Because that made them ugly, apparently, and she hated beauty. Except, emotions aren't ugly. Like, if somebody looks mysterious, which is an emotion that she used in the episode, that's not ugly. Another villain wanted to make everything 1980s because... Yeah, because. Then there was one who wanted to use Girl Scout cookies to make everyone overweight for no reason. I, I watched that episode a, a few times. It was originally going to be this review. I could not figure out why the fuck she wanted to do what she was doing. In another episode, someone is kidnapping blonde women and sucking out their energy to make their hair grow so they could harvest it. These are even bizarre for parody villain plans. But the tone and the style of this show, it, it doesn't really look or feel like it wants to be a parody. It kind of feels like it's trying to take itself seriously on some level. Totally Spies takes on a more realistic art style than most of its contemporaries, and it's not bouncy and over the top. The pieces just don't fit together. So instead, it becomes trying to tell a serious story about a villain, wanting to turn everyone in the world to, into dogs because he doesn't like people. And yes, that was another episode. Hold it right there, 
you right after Labor Day wearing Super Freak? Honestly, that might be my biggest problem with the show. The dialogue. I don't think one line isn't cringe-worthily awful. I don't know if it's trying to be funny or clever or silly even, but whatever it's doing, it's not succeeding. I've made my opinions on slang and animation very well known in the past, and here it very much feels like they're just making shit up. This was originally made in France, remember, and had to be translated. And that adds even more problems to the trying to replicate slang. A good chunk of this three-part episode is about the scientist releasing random inventions one by one that do nothing at all. This one is an evil virus designed to infect spies. I call it the Spyrus. And I call it lame. There's a reason that viruses aren't the size of a potato, dumbass. They end up taking something called the suds and start jetpacking to Jerry for analysis. Good thing we're secret agents, or else our job would be way too embarrassing. One of you got turned into a mime for an episode. That's embarrassing regardless of your status as a spy. They hit a bunch of birds, and this makes them drop the suds without realizing it. It lands in Mandy's pool. Oh, I didn't mention this before, but I hate Mandy. For more than the reasons that I'm supposed to. She's just stuck up snooty and an idiot. Like any other mean girl character that I've ever seen. You gotta do at least a little bit new, but Mandy hits pretty much the cliche to a T. Even the intentional stuff, like her laughing and her manner of speaking, it's hard to watch on extended periods of time. To the show's credit, she usually doesn't have much screen time, but in this episode, she's more or less our villain. Because everyone in this show is a moron, they stay swimming in the glowing green snot bubbles. Clover, Sam, and Alex come to the kitchen, and they end up finding clones of themselves sitting there waiting for them. Must have been a part of the scientist's evil plan. <laughs> We were all talking about how long it's been since we've seen our girls. And about how much we missed you. So we thought why not fly in from Europe and surprise you. What? Okay. There's lazy character design. And then there's this. Were the girls like virgin births or something? Because they clear as hell don't have any paternal DNA. Actually, I'm fairly sure that these three are asexual. Like microbial asexual. Because they are literal clones of Alex... Sam and Clover. Their mothers had to have reproduced by budding for them to be this similar. They look too young to even be their older sisters. They're fucking clones. They try to make them look a little bit different, but they look like clones with insomnia. It doesn't help the two of them are played by the same voice actor, and they don't even have a deepening effect in their voice. It just sounds like how they'd sound if they were trying to mock their father. And this isn't a problem that always existed. Here's what the girls' mothers looked like in their Mother's Day episode, which came out two seasons earlier. They looked older in the earlier episode. Do they have some weird kind of disease that makes them age backwards or something? Alex's mother's hair has even dyed differently. To be the exact exact same as her daughters, which is kind of creepy. Wait, are they going out of their way to look exactly like their daughters because of a wacky set of circumstances that has forced them to try to infiltrate the local high school on a drug bust? Because that's the only way that this would be excusable. Anyway, their visit is unexpected because their parents, like, totally live in Europe. I'll stop. I, I, I will stop. I said I was gonna stop, and I'm gonna stop. And what are those strange looking things on your backs? Back? Packs. They claim to be entirely secret free, but Jerry drops them because he does that. No matter where in the world that the girls are, Jerry has the power and will to just kidnap the three of them. Does it all the time with no issues whatsoever, and apparently not even considering who might else be around. Okay, it's official! We're totally busted! Roll credits! Sorry to call you in so soon after your last mission, girls, but Woof is having an enrollment crisis, and I need you to help me find some new recruits ASAP. Jerry not observing what's around the girls when he kidnaps them is actually a big and ongoing problem. He wants his agency to remain a secret, right? I know that the show isn't trying to be a tour de force of writing or anything, but this is basic stuff that probably should have been looked over. Even a show that doesn't take its plot and story seriously at all should be internally consistent. I want you girls to explain what's going on here immediately! And this time, it had better be the truth! That's it? You've just been found out and so you're just gonna tell them? No way to try to weasel your way out of this? I mean, in any other secret agency, they just use the Men in Black style amnesia beam. Which is a possible thing in the world of Totally Spies, by the way. There was an amnesia episode. We've always wanted to tell you about it, but couldn't risk revealing our secret identities. What secret identities? At least Clark Kent wore the fucking glasses. 
But I guess the glasses would like just totally ruin the look and everything. Oh my god, it's infecting me! Being a spy isn't seedy, it's noble. Right, getting espionage on other countries' governments, whether they're friends or not, killing off the right people to get politics to go in a certain direction. Not seedy at all. And your girls are invaluable members of the Whoop. I'm just gonna start telling people that they're valuable members of the Whoop in real life and just see how many times and how badly I get beat up. Then the girls get kicked out of their beach house and get grounded. Wait a minute, they're they're old enough to live on their own, but young enough to be grounded. Oh wait, I forgot uber uber rich Beverly Hills kids. They could buy their pet goldfish its own mansion. But uh, pretty sure that putting your kids in their own house while you go to a different continent is considered neglect in some countries. I love how Clover is just shocked. Like, it's the worst thing ever that she just got kicked out of her own private beach house. And they're expecting a, a typical audience to relate to that on some level. I wonder how she'd react, like, if one of her relatives was in the hospital or something. Gladys, would you kindly show the girls' mothers the way out? My pleasure. Wait, the computer that helps run the facility is named GLaDOS. Hi. Oh, how are you holding up? Because I'm a potato. That's fucking awesome! Jerry tries to cheer them up by telling them that being spies is a part of them and no one can take that away from them. He says that all of the Whoop agents have a special kind of gene that makes them spies. Also, he began this scene claiming that he was having trouble finding new recruits for Whoop. Even though there is a gene that he can detect that determines whether or not people are good at this career. I, I really do want to point out how fucking stupid this spy gene thing is. First of all, could you imagine if there were genes that basically determined that you'd have some other far less glamorous career? I'm gonna get rich and have an amazing career as a lawyer. No, you must be true to yourself. You see, you have the janitor gene buried deep with inside you. It is locked in your DNA, but you know it to be true. Where the fuck have you been? I'm sorry? It's been three years. Where the fuck have you been? Grocery shopping. For three years. Look, there is no limit to the amount of time that a wise man will wait for real maple syrup, and not that flavorless tree water that the grocery store calls maple syrup. Just go stand in the corner and don't say anything. This is a long review already. I, I don't need pointless sketches. What are you reviewing? Totally Spies. Hey, I like that show. Corner! Where was I? Oh yes, Totally Spies is giving us a crash course on determinism and how the choices we make in life are pointless because our DNA determines what we can and can't do for our entire lives. Uh, no offense, dear, but why didn't you tell us this info sooner? I was waiting for the right moment. What the fuck does that even mean? Why? Jerry takes all the girls' spy stuff and basically screws them over with no means of ever contacting him again, even though they've spent their entire lives racking up new enemies. And they apparently have a gene that might make them a target for someone who hates spies. You know, like Manny and her friends, who have been turned into spy assassins because of the suds. Meanwhile, Sam is being all sad that she can't risk her life on a daily basis anymore. I'll go get the rest of your things from the car, then we can talk about safer careers options, like being a librarian or a foot doctor. I know I already talked about this line specifically, but it still mystifies me. Why would you suggest, specifically, being a foot doctor? Okay, I mean, considering the show I'm reviewing, I know why, but why? In universe, wouldn't she just suggest doctor? General practitioner. No, it has to be a foot doctor specifically. And I don't know about being totally safe. I've seen some bad cases of athlete's foot in my life. Then Sam gets attacked by one of Mandy's friends, because she could buy spy gear at any local department store. The action in this show is actually pretty good, I will admit that. It's well animated, very fluid, and yes, it is the best part of the show. Minus lines like this. I'm taking you out, even if I have to wrinkle my cute little outfit to do it. Special mother-daughter together time, wonderful, sweetie. Oh, yeah. Grocery shopping, real special. And now that you're done with this spy business, you'll have plenty of time for more important things. Like finding a nice boyfriend. What is wrong with you? I know that it might be a bit of a stereotypical parent thing to want grandkids, but Alex can't be older than 18 or this grounding is pointless, right? As far as I know, Alex is still in high school. Go find me a nice jar of pickles. That's not a euphemism, is it? Knowing what I know about this show, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Then Alex gets attacked by a giant pickle. Another one of Mandy's friends in disguise. I think this plan has the fatal flaw of picking out people that don't have any combat training. Go ahead, spy! Run away! 
Also, doesn't it kind of defeat the point of spying if there's a gene that anyone can detect that tells them if you're a spy? You do know what a spy is, right? E even a fiction land fantasy spy, you know what that is, right? You know what they do. Clover fights Mandy, which ends up with Mandy falling into a pile of shit. I'm not even kidding. She falls into the sewer and brown water comes up. The girls decide that the only way to get to the bottom of this is to go spying. Hello? I'm not talking about doing any actual spying. Think of it more like investigating. No, you're just watching a person for the purposes of espionage while making sure that they don't notice you. That has nothing to do with spying whatsoever. A as far as this show is concerned, that might as well be the truth. Anyway, they find out that the Suds have fallen into the hot tub, and that's what's been making Mandy and her friends act crazy. Well, comparatively crazy, anyway. They climb up the tree for a better view. Now those lasers managed to escape our first wave of attacks! Question, where the fuck did you get all this stuff? The scientist who invented the Suds is in jail, and it's never been established that these three could even get in contact with him. I get that they're rich, but there are some things that even rich people can't buy, like pretty much anything that you see here. So, we'll have to be way more stealthy during that second wave! And it's even more stealthy if I shout my plans loud enough for everyone to hear! Unfortunately, the three girls get caught. You know, if you fail to identify the three people near you, and were easily caught by them, you might not have been the best spies in the first place. Just saying. Yes! We have to do something about you three constantly disobeying us! You bought them their own house to live in without you or any parental supervision. And you seem to be surprised when they have a higher expectation of privacy than your average child. What is wrong with you? Oh yeah, I guess the cloning must have scrambled your brains just a little bit. So the three girls aren't allowed to see each other anymore, and their mothers drag them away. Wait, how could they do that if they all lived in the same house? Oh wait, these girls are all so rich that Bill Gates would have trouble relating. They probably have more houses. What is with all the racket down there? You, you tell me, you're the spy assassin with all the high-tech equipment. Or is it out of your capabilities to detect people shouting right outside your bedroom window? Our girls are completely out of control. We need to do something to make them respect us. Sorry, gun event. You three are horrible. Some of the worst parents that I've seen in a cartoon for quite some time. We need to get them to respect us again. Here's an idea. Maybe they'd respect you if you were actually in their fucking lives, instead of buying them their own house to get away from them. You don't get to complain about them not listening to you, you incompetent morons. We've talked about this anger thing. Yes, and we've also talked about this corner thing. Perhaps living on their own was a gift or a privilege that came from the parents' understanding and love. Did you ever think about that? Oh, okay. So they went out of their way to buy their kids their own house because they were so gosh darn good. And then they ended up surprised when their teenagers seemed the least bit spoiled. Well, when you put it like that... Corner. Corner. Sam does chemistry and learns that the Suds make people go out of their way to destroy spies and somehow be able to detect them. Then Sam's mother calls in and the three moms get kidnapped. Sam decides to call in the reinforcements to, you know, save their parents' lives. What the f what the fuck is wrong with the animation here? You see? More trouble caused by this spy business! I love it how they're talking about this super risky career, which I'm pretty sure breaks child labor laws, as if the girls got an after-school hobby that they don't like. Like, if the girls join chess club or something. Anyway, it's here that you find some of the typical plot holes that you find in most spy shows. Because I'm not really into the show so far, they do end up being an extra dose of distracting. The girls' mothers were kidnapped at a public restaurant during business hours. Sure, it was night, but everyone was talking extremely loudly. They were being pulled through a street in the early night. It is highly probable that they were seen by someone. But if Mandy touches a single hair on my mother's tragically outdated quaff... I don't know what that word quaff means, but if you're talking about hairstyles, you two have the same. The exact! Same hairstyle. Y you know what? Fuck it. Urban Dictionary to the record. Yeah, quaff can mean hair. Third definition. You have the exact same hairstyle, you moron! Great! Our mothers are gone, and it's all our fault! What are you talking about? You didn't make the spy assassin chemical, and it was designed to make them attack people with the spy gene. Something you would have had whether or not you became spies with Whoop. No part of your choices actually factored into this particular kidnapping. On to part two. You mean something like that? Hmm? It's a brochure for the Sugar Flake Ski Resort. Kind of looks to me to be a brochure for snow, which doesn't seem to be a very appealing vacation destination. Fucking hate snow. Also, here's another criticism that I have. Sam is the smart one of the group. Or she might be trying to set us up. 
which means we better be careful. This is because everyone else is moronic. Like some of the dumbest people that I've ever seen in a cartoon. And I've seen a lot of dumb people in cartoons. Of the three girls, Sam is the only one who can point out what a kindergartner would have figured out. Because fuck it, these are cliches that we can get away with because it's a spy show. The three of them decide to visit Whoop when they realize that they don't have Jerry's number. Meanwhile, Jerry is looking for recruitments for Whoop. Stop. Okay, there's a spy gene that is possible and apparently rather easy to detect, making the whole spy thing rather counterintuitive, but I digress. Jerry has the ability to track down the spy gene. Now, Shaw, I want you to say that back to me, but say it slowly this time, and maybe you'll figure out the problem with this. Excuse me, boys. I was wondering if you could answer a question. Sure, Gramps, fire away. If you had to choose between climbing an icy summit blindfolded, traversing the ocean in a deflating lifeboat, or halting a locomotive with your bare hands, which would you prefer to do? Is he coming on to them? Apparently, they don't possess the spy gene. Okay, you could detect it in Sam, Cloper, and Alex. The suds gives people the automatic ability to smell who has it. And apparently, if you have enough wealth in this world, you can buy whatever the fuck you want. I don't get the issue here. Also, Jerry has GLaDOS on his phone, but when the girls try to enter the building, she doesn't even tell him about this. Yeah, as you might have guessed, GLaDOS is a bit of a dick. Let me give it a shot. After all, GLaDOS always did like me best. <laughs> Access denied. Okay, enough games, GLaDOS. You need to stop goofing around and let us in right now. When you die, I'm going to laminate your skeleton and pose you in the lobby. You gotta listen to us, Gladys! It's an emergency! Yeah! Mandy kidnapped our moms and we need to speak to Jerry on the double! I feel awful about that surprise. Tell you what, let's give your parents a call right now. The birth parents you are trying to reach do not love you. Please hang up. Oh, that's sad. So after being denied entry to the building, Sam decides to write Jerry a letter. The simplest of plans. It requires her to go up a skyscraper and turn it into a paper airplane and launch it through the window. Couldn't she, I don't know, stick it on the door with some scotch tape? He has to go in through the door, doesn't he? Sam is supposed to be the smart one, right? In what circumstances is any part of this plan considered to be a good idea? I think I'd be a lot more confident if you were quieter. What was that? We can't hear you because you're so high up. Oh. Clover, she said not to look down because it's a cliche that we just had to do. You shouldn't do it. It'll remind you that if you fall, you're gonna die. Also, I'm pretty sure that this is the least unbelievable thing so far, but at that altitude, there's no way to reliably aim a paper airplane. The air is gonna take that thing to Nebraska. Sam! Guess all that note passing in class finally paid off. What class do you go to that has fucking skyscrapers? The dialogue in this show is so bad. I don't know if it's trying to be funny, but it is legitimately some of the most stupidly written lines that I've ever encountered. It is fascinating some of the shit that this show spurts at me. It's like I'm listening to Sen Riddles. The girls decide that they need gadgets if they want to defeat Mandy. And honestly, it would have been a pretty cool thing if the moral of this episode was that they don't need gadgets to defeat the bad guys. They're strong on their own and capable as people. Fuck, that was the moral of Ape Escape. And it had some brilliant lines too. But nope, they just go to a hardware store. Just a fucking hardware store. Beverly Hills has a hardware store? You're the kind of people that use $100 bills as toilet paper, aren't you? Then we get a montage of them going through the hardware store looking for things. <laughs> this will be perfect for breaking and entering. You're at a hardware store and you want to find something to help you break and enter. Okay, pretty good place for it. Y you got that step down. But instead of maybe a hammer or a 2x4 or a sledgehammer, no, you buy a fucking can opener. I wasn't even aware that you could buy can openers at hardware stores. Who needs an expandable cable bungee belt when you've got a garden hose? I also want to point out that you're standing in a public store talking loudly about breaking and entering. Yeah, the teenager that they got staffed there is standing in the next aisle. He can hear every word that you're saying. For spies, you don't know the meaning of the word stealth, do you? Actually, considering their intelligence, that could very well be the case. And of course, what spy would be complete without her sassy outfit? You look like janitors, which is actually the closest that they've ever come to looking like spies in the show's history, so pretty good on them there. Perhaps I ought to try something new, but what? I know! 
I'll place a classified advertisement. You're going to place an advertisement in the public newspaper for a spy position. Does anyone on this show know what the fuck a spy actually is? I get that the show isn't trying to be the smartest thing ever, or the most realistic. It's not going to tell us about the actual life of actual spies. And it doesn't entirely care about the suspension of disbelief. But there's only so far that you could stretch that. Sure, media spies are all about looking cool or whatever, having a lot of gadgets and there are loud explosions, and are nothing like real spies that sit at a computer and read random people's texts messing each other about letting the dog out. But there are some things that are just married to the concept of being a spy, even in media. It's what makes it attractive and cool as an idea. And secret identities, espionage, getting intel on your enemies, those are all part of the spy concept and what attracts a lot of people to them. At least pretend to have secret identities. Pre Pretend that it's impossible for any random Joe to figure out who the hell these girls are. That's a lot of what escapist media is. An agreement between the creator and the audience to pretend that this is the way things are, or that this is possible. But the creator needs to put up things to build and maintain the illusion. Clark Kent's glasses are a pretty good comparison, going back to that analogy. No one in history has really been fooled by them. But that's not what the glasses are about. They're not about fooling an audience. They're about fooling the characters within the show. And because they can fool the characters within the show, it creates an agreement with the audience. This is the fantasy. There is none of this in Totally Spies. And it's true that suspension of disbelief has lowered in general audiences over the years. You couldn't exactly make a Clark Kent today without people laughing you out of Hollywood. But on some level, you can never avoid asking for suspension of disbelief. With the more serious and gritty Batman, you have to agree to pretend that a multi-millionaire wants to put on disguise and fight a man who dresses up like a clown. There's no way to get around that without altering the fundamental concept of Batman. A similar show to Totally Spies would be Kim Possible, a show that is better than Totally Spies in basically every single way. The show is about a teenage girl going around the world and beating insane bad guys to to save the world, like Totally Spies, and it's another show that tries to sell its audience a fantasy. However, it's a lot more cohesive. Kim Possible doesn't have a secret identity because that's not needed. The show, for the most part, keeps the villains separate from her personal life. They keep what they have from contradicting itself. A show can have any premise ever, especially in animation. There are no limitations. You want a kid who can use chalk to enter a fantasy world? Okay, you want an organization of children fighting superpowered adults, then that's okay too. But no matter what premise you choose, it has to be internally consistent. You make a rule, you have to follow that rule. If you're going to tell me that these are secret agents, don't give me an ability to detect who is and who isn't a secret agent. And then definitely don't tell me that the organization is having a hard time finding new recruits. That's three fantasy-shattering contradictions right there, all within the same episode. This is why writers do a lot of writing and planning and world-building before they actually set pens to paper and actually start writing the damn script. Yes, there is such a thing as taking a show too seriously, especially something like this that does not take itself seriously at all. But then there's the other end of the spectrum, where a show expects you to buy anything. It doesn't put in the effort to basically pay for what it's asking the audience for, no matter the show, and no matter the genre. Internal consistency is extremely important. Even shows with more out there premises, like the Powerpuff Girls, are internally consistent, barring a, a few bad episodes here and there. Fuck, even Wayside, which predicated itself on nonsense and contradictory rules was more internally consistent than this show. Actually, I will give Wayside credit there. It is a very good example of exploring this idea. How far you can really push the rules of your world while still having it be internally consistent. So, Jerry gets the note and he decides to help the girls by getting a helicopter. This resort is so hot. I'm surprised all the snow doesn't melt. That pun was bad and you should feel bad. So they go to the resort that's obviously Mandy's. They know it's Mandy's because it's the only one shaped like an M. Here's the plan. You guys go around to the side windows and I'll use the can opener to unlock the back door. What? I'll use the can opener to unlock the back door. Um, yes. What? I'll use the can opener to unlock the back door. It's, it's a fucking can opener. How do you open a door? A fucking door with a fucking can opener. I, I can't even visualize this. What the hell? I mean, am I supposed to use this little flippy gear thing? You can't do that because the metal part would get in the way. Am I... Am I supposed to use, like, this for the, uh, For a lockpick? You're gonna do that? Use a fucking screwdriver. Uh... 
What do I do? I use these as pawns to turn the or like. I don't think they even know how you use a can opener to open a door because they don't show it on screen. It's not a mistranslation either. She actually has the can opener in her hand. Unless this is another four kids jelly donut kind of deal that she actually has a blowtorch. At least when DuckTales used a tuning fork to break out of a prison cell, we saw how the tuning fork did it. And after all this, they don't even go through the door. They just ignore that the door exists. Yeah, they just say that Sam is unlocking a door with a can opener that she bought from the hardware store. They don't show how she does this, and they never end up even going through the fucking door. Instead, they hear their mother's shouts coming from inside a gondola. So after falling over like dumbasses, they use the garden hose to climb up. You know what, at this point it's not even worth questioning. Can openers are lock picks, and garden hoses are ropes. How are we ever gonna get up there? I got it! We can plunge our way up! You're testing me. You're really testing me, aren't you? They unlock the gondola's door, presumably with a can opener, and then they free their mothers, who are instantly pissed. Okay, now I'm pissed. The girls were following along their punishment, and they only decided to do more spy stuff again after their mothers got kidnapped. Well, with the exception of Sam, but her mother doesn't know that. And if they actually listened to their parents and didn't save them, they'd still be trapped in this gondola until, I guess, the wind blew it off its cord and they all died. So excuse me if I think that the parents are being a little bit unreasonable. I get that the episode is supposed to make them seem a little bit unreasonable, but it's so detached from any form of logic, it just comes across as stupid. And these three come across as far more unlikable and, well, stupid than they probably should. It almost seems like the girls are playing through a fantasy of what would happen if their mothers ever caught them in their heads, and making shit up in their own warped fantasy land. And that impression is not held by the similar character designs and voice acting. In fact, that's my interpretation of this episode now. But if you weren't spies in the first place, you wouldn't have to be saving us. And if you were actually involved in your daughter's lives, then they wouldn't have been spies in the first place. So, uh, your move. Just use your can opener. And no, I'm not letting that go. I am never letting that go. How do you unlock a door with a fucking can opener? Oh, I knew we should have gotten some sort of prying gadget at the hardware store. Do you mean a crowbar? So Mandy uses a remote control to make the gun go extremely fast. In order to escape, Sam uses a tennis racket. Sure, that has enough force to pop out a window from its socket. On a gondola that has windows specifically designed from people falling out. I hope this is part of a bigger, more impressive plan, Sam! It is! Now take off your suits! I I'm not even gonna touch that one. Okay, so what do we do with these now? Use them as parachutes! Oh my fucking god. Even MacGyver is looking at this show and just going, just, just, just stop. Stop what you're doing and rethink your life. But you know what? Fuck it. I, I, got, I got a pair of sunglasses. I'm gonna use it to hotwire a car, record a mixtape, file my taxes, and jetpack to the fucking moon! After saving their mother's lives, twice, They've changed their tune. Yay, we're all a big, happy, dysfunctional, neglectful family now. Too bad we got five minutes in another part. Yeah, here's another complaint. This episode drags on too long. As you might be able to tell by now, I'm actually losing my voice recording this episode. From this point on, the girls could stop Mandy in the five minutes remaining in part two, but no, it's gotta go on for another half an hour. And the plot spreads really thin. You girls are awesome! You really mean it? Absolutely, and you work so beautifully together, like a well-oiled spy machine. We cared before that you were risking your lives, but now we don't because you do it so well together. Well, truth be told, we're actually super spies. You're not super anything. Super stupid, maybe. Mandy tries to run them down with a snowmobile, but they use the broken pieces of the gondola to snowboard. And Jerry has a helicopter, yay! <laughs> Please do not remind me of Batman and Robin. Hey! You paid for that! And I mean literally! It was really expensive! Where can you buy a snowmobile with a built-in heat ray? Fuck you! Fuck you in the ass! says the biggest valley girl stereotype in television history. And the snow machines lead Mandy and Co. down the hill. Can we please move on to the final part? I, w I want to be done with this. Look at that. They've already apprehended those nasty villains. You really should lock that Mandy girl up for a long, long time, Harry. 
It's Jerry. Yeah, no one in their right mind should be calling that man Harry. I I'm sorry, it's been a long episode. My brain is fried. Don't worry though, I will get my can opener after this and I will be absolutely fine. So, an avalanche comes down and ruins the girl's happy ending, burying all six of them. Part 3 starts with Whoop looking for the girls with metal detectors. Yeah, because you could be 100% sure that they had some kind of metal on them when they were buried. Bottom line, he can't seem to find the girls anywhere on the mountain, despite previously being able to summon them from literally any spot in the world. It turns out that Mandy and her friends got out of the situation fine, but Sam, Clover, and Alex, not so much. The girls get kidnapped, and we get the greatest of all spy show cliches, the villain not killing off the spies when they have a chance, preferring to do it at a special place or in a convoluted way. This episode came out in 2001. It's getting old. I am taking you to the place where I do my deepest thinking, the groove. You're going to secretly murder these secret agents in a public restaurant. Then again, I guess I don't blame you since they don't tend to notice when their customers are kidnapped screaming and the kidnappers drive away in a loud vehicle. Coco is for spy assassins only! That has got to become like a meme or something. Now we go to the mothers crying over their daughters being dead. So they hated them being spies because they were actually risking their lives. And now that they think that they're actually dead, they go on to tell about how great spies their daughters were. What is with these characters? You tell them anything, and they change their opinions immediately. I want a vote for Candidate A. A Candidate A is preventing the sale of death laser snowmobiles from hardware stores. Well, that settles it. I'm voting for Candidate B. But seriously, I got where the girls got their intelligence from, along with everything else, I guess. We cut back to the car. Oh, Mandy's using Celsius on them. Now that's fucking evil. Sam has her mother's cell phone, but Mandy smashes it. However, one call gets through, and it's decided that the girls' mothers must become super secret agents to save them. But there's an entire screening process. But weren't you on the streets asking random people if they wanted to be spies? He even ends up mentioning this in this particular scene. Is it a joke? I'm asking because I literally do not know. I mean, all of these random plot holes in Bouts of Insane Logic could very well be jokes, but they're not conveyed or told like jokes. It is time to put the Al in downfall! What does that even mean? N your name isn't Al! So in a moment of brilliance, Alex, who somehow still has the suds in her back pocket, in a glass container that hasn't broken despite them falling from a gondola, tells the people that want to kill her that the suds turn people into people that want to kill her. It was created by this bad guy named the Inventor! No relation to that other Inventor. I mean, what better way to get rid of the Get rid of themselves. What what are you gonna do with the survivor? The chance of a final double knockout is actually pretty slim. That's an awesome idea! You are so brill! Isn't a brill a fish? Yeah. It, it, it's this fucking thing. Put put a brill on the screen. Put put brills everywhere on the screen. It, yeah, yeah, sure, Mandy is a brill. Meanwhile, the spies' mothers suck at spying. Despite ending up having this spy gene thing at the end. What is it supposed to do again exactly? The Suds infect Alex, Sam, and Clover, and they're subjected to the worst thing that they've ever had to deal with in their young lives. They're forced to call in six the Krusty Krab. You knew that that had to be coming at some point, and I do not apologize. Come on, girls! We have more important things to do! Like what? No, I I'm serious, like what? This is the most basic spy villain stuff. Wait around for your adversaries to die! So, after the mothers remember that they've got, like, daughters that need saving, they decide to actually start taking the training to save their daughters' lives seriously. I mean, with the way that they've been acting, it's like someone was trying to get them into a popular video game because their kids were entering a tournament, not something where actual lives were at stake. No offense, Gladys. Satellite triangulation of all cell phone usage in the past 12 hours. They've been training for one day. One day. How the fuck did they become super hackers? They didn't even do any computer stuff in the montage. Yeah, they know satellite computer cell phone shit that even Jerry doesn't know. They figure out where the girls are and they end up taking a helicopter to the groove. Perfect vehicle choice. Highly public area, wants to keep a low profile, lets you something loud that generates a lot of fucking wind. You do know what the purpose of a helicopter is, right? Then, one by one, Jerry just rambles off some random gadgets. I get that this is a special episode so regular viewers should already know what they do, but as a viewer just watching in this episode in particular, I have no idea what any of this stuff is. Clover, I don't know what this is all about, but- Really? You haven't the slightest clue. Finally, Jerry comes down and creates an antidote, like, right on the spot. Yeah, in this show, everyone's either an abject moron who can't tie their own shoes, or a super genius that can hack computers in an instant, despite no prior training in that field. Don't worry, we plan on respectfully putting you out of your misery! You've got all of this action, and explosions, and a theme song that is based on a song literally about sex. 
and you still can't just say the words death or kill. In a show like this, these standards and practices get really distracting sometimes. Especially because using the words that they want to would convey the exact same meaning that any audience member would get. So Jerry uses the antidote and the girls turn back to normal. Jerry, you must have us confused with Mandy and her toadies. Isn't a toady a type of purse? Mandy and her friends release the evil inventor from prison. No, the, the other evil inventor, supervillain. I'm geeking out here! No, never mind. <gasps> Mandy and the Inventor? What are those two doing in cahoots? What are the Spy Assassins and the guy that made Mandy and the other Spy Assassins doing in cahoots? Gee, I wonder, Jerry. Didn't you just create an antidote on the spot? How the fuck did you get to be the leader of a secret agency bent on world protection? So the Inventor and Mandy want to use a biplane to spread suds all over the world. Yes, a biplane. Just... A normal crop duster. You're not gonna get very far with that. But luckily, the girls go in to fight them. And why did you bring your mothers along? Because we support whatever our daughters do. Are, are you sure about that? Because I think Alex is doing crack cocaine in the corner over there. Maybe not yet, but if you're letting these rich girls just live alone on their own, uh, why, why the fuck not? I, I guess as long as she's not going out of her way to save your life, then it's fine. Spy racer, laser vision spy balls, and my acid venom spiders! <laughs> okay, these gadgets have just gone from lame to silly. The, 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 the fucking can opener! Can opener! Can opener! So the action scene, and we, we get some comments about hair. I don't suppose after all this is over, you'd be interested in having dinner with me? With hair like that, I wouldn't be caught in public or private with you. What's with all the hair criticism? It's meant to give me cred in the mad scientist community. All that hair is going to get you is a lawsuit from Dr. Wiley. <laughs> I resent that. So, action scene. Mandy takes a shit in a plane, and the day is saved. Everything is back to normal. And the episode ends with the greatest of all twists. We zoom out, and we see that they've been on the moon the entire time. Yes. It zooms out, and we get, we get a shot of the fucking moon. And that's how the episode ends. Just, just the moon. I mean, it, it, it might be... A production logo but it is really fitting with everything else that I've seen so do you see why I don't like this show there are a lot of things to not like the characters the dialogue oh god the dialogue the valley girl stereotypes are just cringe inducing and the show doesn't even try to ground itself in even its own reality personally I have written a lot of stuff that could never happen in the real world and it doesn't pretend and it does take a media's interpretation on this or that cliche I try my damnedest to make sure that it follows its own rules and stays internally, logically consistent. It is one of the bare basics of writing fiction. The plots here take bizarre leaps of logic that I don't think that I could ever have suspended my disbelief far enough for. But I get it, a lot of people like this show. More than that, it's an important show to a lot of people. And that is kind of impressive considering what we have here. As much as the fetish aspect is joked to death, look, if it's an aspect of yourself that you enjoy and you're not hurting anyone, there isn't anything wrong with that at all. I don't think that the show is so forward with it that it can't be ignored, so I, I don't really have a problem with it. It's not like Squid Baby from Spongebob, for instance. Even beyond that, a lot of people can get past things that bug me for the spy gadgets and the characters having a very upper-class lifestyle. It definitely tried more than some other shows pandering to young girls. I, I, I will give it that. And I could definitely see some people enjoying this show because of its flaws. I find it a little too tedious to be so bad it's good, uh, but I, I could totally understand you having that opinion. If you like the show, genuinely, you're not alone. Far from it. Like I said, this is probably my number one show that I hate that everyone else likes. No, there is one more. Oh great, we're doing this. Yes, we are, and you must review it. Why? I have a sore throat right now. Why? Because I said so. It is a part of your quest. And besides, if you don't do it now, you'll get endless comments prodding you about it until the day that you do. You got me there. Alright, just hit me. What am I doing next time? Oh my fucking god. Anything but that. If I do that, I will be massacred. Oh, do not worry. You're only going to be reviewing the first season. And even fans of The Legend of Korra say that it didn't hit its stride until the third season. You know what? I think I'll take you up on that janitor job. I, I have the genes for it, right? John, you must persevere through this. Trust me. 
things will soon be getting intense, and you must persevere. I will be massacred if I do this. Fine, take this. It will help you on your way. A, a can opener? Yes, a can opener. Is it a secret agent gadget that shoots laser beams and stops planes or whatever? No, it is a can opener. It opens cans. I hate every part of you. Just fucking review the first season of Korra already.